David Brewster here with a new episode of Soloing Secrets, and this is Tom Scholes, the legendary guitarist from the band Boston, and I've had some requests to feature more of Boston's music, and if you search on my channel, you'll find an episode of Chord Play for Boston, also a Three for All for Tom. I think we were doing a lot of tapping in that lesson, but this is the first time we've really attacked his soloing style, and what a unique and interesting and melodic and expressive guitarist, for sure. And what a unique human being, too, an MIT grad, he's got a master's degree in mechanical engineering, which is very impressive. And he's literally the sound of Boston. You know, I mean, no offense to the drums and bass and vocals, but when you hear a Boston song like on the radio, it's that guitar tone. You know, those layers of guitars, those huge harmonies and melodies. You know, great stuff. And he's the original do-it-yourselfer, too. you got to remember, originally he had a home studio and he was demoing songs for over six years before the record labels, you know, paid attention to him and his music. And that's so impressive. You know, what a legendary musician, for sure. So just like we've done in other episodes in the Soloing Secret series, when you're checking out a certain player or band, it's always a great idea to check out their influences, which will reveal some of their playing habits and techniques and ideas, you know, normally. And with Tom, his influences are really interesting. On the rock side, he was obviously a big fan of the bands, like the Kinks and the Animals and the Yardbirds. Big Jimmy Page and big Jeff Beck fan. Also a big Steppenwolf fan. But then Tom studied classical piano as a kid, and he has classical influences too. Beethoven and Chopin and uh, Tchaikovsky and people like that. But here's an image with some of Tom's elusive musical influences. And as far as Tom's actual soloing secrets, the things he typically likes to do when he picks up a guitar and plays a lick or a fill or a solo, and there's a lot here. He's got the rock and blues-based you know, influences, a lot of, you know, soulful string bending and vibrato and a lot of feel, you know, when he plays. Definitely a very feel-based player. But then the classical side, you know, steps in. And there are these huge themes and melodies and layers of guitar. He approaches the guitar almost like an orchestra where he layers all these parts and he harmonizes things. And everything's definitely very melodic, too, which is really impressive. But here's an image, you know, showing some of Tom's elusive, you know, soloing secrets. So you really can't have a conversation about Tom Scholz without mentioning Rockman somewhere, you know, the company that he founded in 1980, and they released a lot of products, you know, the half rack space modules that had a whole bunch of different effects and tones, and uh, of course the X100, you know, preamp that a lot of people used. He also had an amplifier that came out. I think that was like an XP100 or something like that. But very interesting, very inspiring amps for sure, and they, keep in mind they were used by Def Leppard and Joe Satriani and a whole bunch of other people on famous albums. And there's something about that tone. And I did read, like, the first two Boston albums actually didn't feature a Rockman. He was using an old Marshall Plexi with a whole bunch of effects, and it was modified heavily. And it captured that sound. And then eventually they basically took that tone and eventually made Rockman products based on his tone, which is so cool. So 
the music and ideas in this episode actually came from the first three Boston albums, and I actually purposely picked different songs and different moments. So I didn't grab the most, you know, famous and popular, you know, ideas. There's no more than the feeling or anything like that in this episode. So I'm kind of doing a deep dive, but we're also hitting very specific areas in Tom's style, too. So there's a reason why I did it this way. And there's some, you know, examples, you know, actually from Tom. There's some kind of exercises to kind of help you play more like Tom. And there's a lot here. So if you're a Boston fan, buckle up, because here we go. The opening jam that was basically me playing around with Still in Love, which is the second half of the song Can't You Say, which is from Third Stage. And this part of the song actually begins somewhere around 222 in that song. And at 222, you'll hear this. <laughs> like a strummed, you know, C major 7 chord right there. And then you hear him pick through it. So it's C major 7 to a D sus 2 to D major. And then it's E sus 4 to E major right there. You do it again, C major 7. And then it's D sus 4 to D major. Sus4 E major again. So that's the chord progression, right? And there's a non-diatonic, you know, chord progression happening. You know, that C major, D major, and E major, you know, doesn't really fit in one key. You know, C major and D major technically are part of G major. The relative minor is E minor, right? So those are related to E minor or G major, technically. So that C major, D major, and then when we finally hit that E major, that's our chord substitution right there. They kind of put that bright twist on that last chord. So as far as soloing over that, you could use, you know, C Lydian over C, and then D Mixolydian over D, and then E Mixolydian over E. Don't want to solo just like that because that's going to sound like you're cutting and pasting you know those scales and, and uh, tonalities together so one trick you could actually use to kind of approach playing over this is since the c and d are both actually part of e minor you could actually play e minor over those first two chords and then when it switches to e major you could change to e major pentatonic and start targeting you know uh, g sharp instead of g but uh I'm going to loop that progression with the MXR clone looper like this. So there's C major 7 to D to E major, right? So here's E minor pentatonic over the top. And there's that G sharp. of what you're playing over like you know exactly what you're going to target whenever that chord comes to E major and uh it's a really kind of advanced you know way of targeting and playing over chord progression and as far as what was Tom you know was playing during the song he had some harmonics right here and then answer that an octave higher way up there and then eventually he started fretting those notes that B and E right there and you hear a little trill at uh, F sharp and G and then that D to E. And eventually you hear him grab this A and bend it to B. And then from there I just started kind of jamming around. Okay. I started running some scales in there, which we're getting ready to talk about that right after this segment. And then I just started outlining that chord progression. again but uh you know really interesting song it's kind of unusual because it's split you know it's technically can't you say and then all of a sudden turns into still in love but i always love that non-diatonic kind of dreamy progression really cool 
And next up, we're going to start playing scales with feel. And this is an area I've had a lot of students over the years sign up for lessons with me and they'd come in and ask, like, how do I play with more emotion? How do I play with more feel? How do I make the things I play pop, you know, and jump in the mix? And that's kind of what we're talking about here. So we're going to borrow the chord progression from Still in Love, that C major 7, D major, to E major that chord progression but we're going to basically outline that progression using scales and I did actually play this during the opening jam I made sure to put it in there because I knew the very next thing after that opening jam you know demo or kind of breakdown was going to be this so we're going to start with that C and keep in mind this is C Lydian we're going to target right here <laughs> sharp, which is your sharp 11, G, A, B, C. But what I want you to do when you play that scale is don't just play it kind of generic, or real staccato or choppy or something. Try to let the notes like really flow into themselves. And play it with a certain level of authority or conviction right there. Lydian right here and do it the same way. You know, the notes and the fingering are different, but perform it the same way that you did C Lydian. And then do it again right there in E mix Lydian. And right there, I'm you know I'm not hurting myself, but I am fretting kind of hard. I'm picking when I do pick. I am using some legato in there, but when I pick, I'm picking hard. And I'm really trying to connect with the string and also make that sound as musical and lyrical as I can. Make it sound like a vocalist singing or a violinist. Right. And let's take that and let's reverse that. And we're going to basically take you know, the same scale, but now we're going to descend and we're going to do this. slow. I'm not worried about speed. I'm worried about connecting with those notes and connecting with the strings and really helping that kind of float along like that. So there's that octave right there. So let's move that up another octave. Let's do it again. C Lydian right here. And then D mix Lydian right there. And then E mix Lydian right there same idea but an octave higher and then practice that descending too To really help you drive this, you know, playing scales with feel idea home. Next up is a melody from Don't Look Back, you know, the title track from the album, Don't Look Back. This is a very familiar melody, but this is the epitome of what we're talking about here. You know, playing scale ideas with lots of a feel and emotion like this. <laughs> so melodic. I mean, he's not really even thinking of things like a guitarist. He's thinking more like a classical composer, you know, with some of his phrasing and the melodies and harmonies and stuff. Right there. <laughs> Thank you. 
but check out Don't Look Back. That's a classic song, but that's definitely a great example of what we're talking about, you know, playing scales with feel. Some more of this melodic phrasing from Tom. Check out the end of the solo from It's Easy, which is also from Don't Look Back, and you'll hear this. <laughs> Tom, for sure. It starts in E minor like this. So you're starting on this E, but ending on that E down there like that. And then start the next phrase on G right here. And then end on F right there. And then from that F, you're doing... Bend and release that C, shift that B flat to A, hammer on pull off, and then end on G right there. Like that. So, uh. Right here. Kind of moving into like D uh, dominant pentatonic. phrase from Tom. This came from Peace of Mind from the first Boston album, and the song Peace of Mind is filled with great guitar parts, great solos, everything. And this is just really just one phrase, but it's a great one, like this. <laughs> stairs kind of feel to it at the end which I like. So he's starting here and then he's position shifting into that. B to A, and then when you get to this G sharp, that's where it kind of like does this blurry. Everything we've hit so far basically revolved around this area or region on the fretboard, like the lower half of the neck, right? And Tom definitely plays a lot of music in that area, but he also plays a lot of higher stuff too, and that's what we're going to target next, some melodies and phrases and bending and stuff in these higher reaches. And up next, this came from Hitcher Ride, and I love Hitcher Ride. I think it's actually tuned down a half step though, but I just moved everything to where it's in the right pitch, so I'm playing this in standard tuning, just a heads up. But this part... here but you really want that to sing you want it to sound like a vocalist or a violinist or somebody playing and uh, it has a very powerful kind of emotive and melodic sound like that <laughs> crazy going on there. There's no impilitary or ingbe licks happening, but it's, it's a lot of power happening in that simple phrase. Now speaking of these higher areas on the fretboard, lots of expression and feel, this is the opening solo from Long Time, so this is right after foreplay, but it's this. <laughs> very famous. 
harmonies right there. So start with this big bend right there, E flat to F. And then you've got this. One more time right there. And then, so after you release that bend, you've got this extra little, you know, melody right there. to that D, back to that F, and then right there, you're kind of, you know, starting like way up here on this F, and then you're going to do that, and then you've got this, so one more time right there. famous guitar solo too and he's just I mean he's just really I mean there's so much power and energy right there he's just tearing it up all right last but not least is a super expressive melody from Hitcher Ride once again I love the song for sure um, and I think it is tuned down a half step. I'm just playing it in standard, just a heads up. So if you do tune down a half step like Boston, you'll have to kind of rework this, you know, in a different tuning. But in standard, we can do it like this. <laughs> crazy happening here. There's no sweeping or string skipping or any shredding, but it's so expressive. I mean, that sounds like something you'd hear like in a classical, you know, composition or symphony or something like that. But you're doing this, right? Kind of a country-fied, like southern rock band right there off the bat. And then, and that's tricky right there. putting those notes and that phrase together and that's how I'm performing it right there and then you're gonna do the same thing but end on C right and then right here that's really weird and, then, and it keeps going there at the end but one more time really slow all like on the 16th fret. You have to kind of come up with some clever ways of fretting that. You know, so expressive, so melodic, and it doesn't really even sound like something you'd hear on a guitar. Once again, it sounds like violin or like a vocal part or maybe a keyboardist or something. And even though there's nothing really crazy going on there, there's no shredding or sweeping or anything insane, but it's just very melodic and very powerful. I mean, it just grabs your attention like, hey, check this out. <laughs> solos and melodies. I mean, they sound like they could be national anthems for other countries and stuff. You know, there's so much, you know, uh, melodic energy and everything in there. It really does have that thematic, almost cinematic kind of sound. So good. That's going to wrap this episode of Soloing Secrets with Tom Scholz. Definitely a legendary guitarist working with a legendary band that released all this legendary music. But for some reason, it seems like he's overlooked and people don't normally think of him when they're thinking of classic rock or great guitarists and music from the 70s or 80s. You know, it seems like he's kind of overlooked usually. And you'll hear, you know, Van Halen and Hendrix and Clapton and Jeff Beck and Jimmy Page and all these names. But then rarely do you ever hear Tom. 
And you should. I mean, definitely his influence is out there. You got to think he had this heavy classical influence pretty much right alongside people like Brian May. Eventually, you had players that were directly influenced by classical. You know, think of like Wolf Hoffman, obviously Ingve, and some players like that. But Tom's take, it's that melodic power and energy from classical, more than speed and, you know, Phrygian dominant and Paganini licks or whatever like Ingve. I think Tom was tapping into a different part of classical music, that thematic power that you hear when you hear a symphony or an orchestra, you know, really belting it out. So anyway, leave some feedback and comments. Please subscribe to the lessons, and I'll be back before you know it with more content and material. Thank you.